little to no pay. This is the criminal. Because we job. love it. Yeah. So do we as documentary yeah. filmmakers. Right? So you can relate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So you're on. Okay, well, I guess I'll yeah, introduce. Uh, my name is Luke Corum, and uh, my role, I kind of wore a lot of hats in this film, uh, mostly writer director. Uh, however, because of the way the film evolved, which we'll get into, I, I also edited the film, and um, I did a little of the cinematography, and then I helped Russell produce it. So, uh, yeah, jack of all trades there. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Russell Groves. Um, as Luke mentioned, I'm the producer with him on the movie. Uh, when it reached a certain point, Luke brought me on, and that was what, two and a half years ago? Yeah. Three years ago? And uh, by reaching a certain point, we meant that it had grown to the point of we're making this into a full full story. Because before, feature film. Feature we didn't film. have a feature film at first. So um, he brought me on because I produced some stuff before. Um, we're both based in Austin. And um, we kind of took it and ran from there. And obviously, y'all have seen the finished products. But we hope you like it. And something to know, neither of us have a background. Um, you didn't go to school for film. No, it's still, still engineering. And I went to school for economics, yeah. so um, we both we both have similar stories in that we went into business stuff and then dove into film, and uh, been doing that for I think each of us ten years. Well, I think the obvious question anytime you see a documentary like this, and, and this is such an interesting story, but uh, all documentaries at some point are consist of thousands of hours of footage, <coughs> hundreds of hours of footage. Yeah. So, how much stuff did you guys have to lose to cut it down to what it is right now? That would be my first question. Um, so, like I said, I, I edited the film, and, which was pretty much a nightmare, <laughs> and uh, very rewarding now, but I definitely went insane in the editing room. We had a cut of this film a year before it was actually done. So, it went through a lot of cutting. I would say we used, percentage-wise, 5%, 10%. Maybe 10%. Maybe 10% of what we shot? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I have to imagine, too, because like some of those scenes like where it's him at a party with some famous person, there's probably hours of footage. The craziness oh, of yeah. the archival is probably the most, that's the largest behemoth in the whole thing. Right. Because there's so many things in the Bewley archives that they, were, they let us use. And he had to spend so much time going through and sifting to find actual good content that would make sense. I, I think what so. makes this film unique um, is that it's very rare that you get a glimpse into the life of the aristocracy in this personal way. And we built a friendship and trust with them where they said, hey, here's our archives. They literally opened it up to us and let us use whatever we wanted. And that's, I think that's extremely rare for someone to be that transparent. So of the archives, I, don't, I mean, literally, I don't know. I don't, 100 hours, maybe? Yeah. And I don't know if we used 20 minutes of it. Well, it's almost kind of indicative of, of him, him as a personality. Like, he opens up his home to everybody. And now these guys are opening up their archives to you, and so it's it's a nice sort of uh, parallel yeah. there. Yes, it was. yeah, it was very very nice. Yeah. How did you come across the idea of even making this film? That's a that's a good question, I and mean, something that um, friends and family were asking me for several years, like what do, what is a Texan doing flying over to England making a film about a British aristocrat? You know, <laughs> that is quite odd, and it is. Uh, short and sweet. Uh, five years ago, I was doing some commercial advertising for a company in San Antonio, and I was making a mini documentary series for him. And a few months into it, their chairman called me into his office and said, hey, love the work you're doing. I have this new project I'd like to throw out to you. I have a fascinating uncle, his name is Lord Montague, and I want you to make a short family film for me. And my initial reaction was, the title Lord is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I've never been to England. Sure, why the heck not? So um, I flew over there with a very small team, meaning three people, and basically was interviewing family and friends of Lord Montague, including himself. And it was during that three week trip that every interview we ran across was like, wow, this guy has a really fascinating life. I mean, read his, I read his um, autobiography, I'd seen a one hour documentary from the BBC, but I didn't really know the, everything about the man. And it was, everybody had these rich stories. So basically from that I, I thought, I wanna make this into a film to share with everybody, not just the family. And thankfully, Graham, the chairman of that company, and the Montague family said, all right, we'll give you our blessing. You can dig deeper. You can make this a film. And that's when Russell came into the picture, and it evolved from there. So, so while you were making the film, was there, were there any moments where you just sat back and went, wow, I would never have imagined this? Or 
Well, you know, the first time driving up to Palace House, which is where Lord Montague lives, it's a 13th century Gothic-style home, looks like a castle, and knowing that I was going to sleep there that night, along the crew, <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, this is incredible. You know, the butler's coming in, literally a butler, you know, helping us, and I mean, it was just amazing. We met, you know, members of the aristocracy, a member of the royal family. It, you know, famous race car drivers. Every day, literally, was was a wow moment. There was something that happened that said, "I can't believe that this is happening." And I guess for me, as the director, I was just like so concentrating on making this a good film that I didn't get to enjoy it enough. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, but uh, yeah, the whole thing is is definitely a dream. I liked in the movie how you showed a different perspective on the British royal class, the nobles, and things. It was. It was something that I'm not familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of people are not familiar with, but it, you looked at, I mean, explain how they, where they, how they started, how much land they have, like, you know, I never could imagine that. Um, I like how I'll they- I'll wait for that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. We're really close to the- We're in the Madeline, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Madeline sounds <laughs> Um Yeah, um, so, Along that line, I think originally going into it, I thought to myself, when I was wanting to make it into a feature film, it was, I've never been to England or met an aristocrat, I don't know anything about this world. In the end, that ended up, midway through, I realized that is actually a great asset because we have every fresh perspective on everything. We don't know anything about the class system. So, a funny thing, we met this, um, you know, a butler would usher in one of the noblemen and he would come down and we'd be interviewing them. And in England, they're, you know, the English people, if they were to meet a nobleman, it would just be this weird interaction, because it's like, are you of a higher class than me? Because it's the class is dying, right? But it's still there ingrained in them. Or as us, we're just Texans going there, interviewing. <laughs> and so neither of us really know how to approach the situation. So one guy, we brought a cowboy hat and salsa, <laughs> to which he uh, he put it on his head and kind of grinned real quick, and then like realized he shouldn't be grinning, I guess, in front of us. Um, so, you know, what was great is in the interviews, we asked a lot of questions um, that maybe a British person might not think to ask because they're more used to it. And at the same time, they were trying to explain things to us and we're fascinated, like, why are you so interested in this? So from that, I think we really got some great anecdotes in the interviews. Um, and so I, th I think it was really helpful that it was an American telling the story about a British aristocrat. I also think that the, uh, um, the land typically varies from family to family and, and all the, the palaces and castles were put up at different times. So we were learning history along the way and a lot of people, they do the tours around in what they call the stately homes. And the stately homes are very, very impressive if you go see them. But Montague's was a pretty good sized piece of land, very small stately home in comparison to a lot of other huge stately homes that have a lot, even a lot more land. So I just wanted to add something whenever you said the sizes of these properties and stuff. So There's a couple of shots uh, throughout the piece where you show Lord Montague. And he uh, obviously he looks a lot older now, He's, he seems pretty frail. Um, was there ever a moment where you guys were able to get him to talk on camera, or was it more of that, I'd rather not talk on camera, but it's okay to at least show me so that, that I'm still around here? So on that first trip, um, I did interview him, and he opened up and he talked about a lot of things. Unfortunately, he has suffered um, a stroke, okay. and it might have been a series of strokes, and so his speech isn't that great. And so in the original rough cut, I put him in the film, um, thinking that maybe it would be a moment, it was right after um, the trial sequence in the prison, and you see him talking on camera about this really powerful story. Um, but it kind of brings down the measure of the man, is what our audience thought, because you, the whole time we only show you shots of him real vaguely present day, because you're seeing him in the archival footage and he is this incredible figure, and when you see him in that frail state, it kind of, kind of brings it, it down. Yeah, so it. we kind of save it to the end. Yeah. So it's a little more endearing. Well, and there's a shot too, if I remember correctly, where it, like there's a, a tent and a group of people are coming through, and he's handing out what looks like cans or something. It was and, yeah. yeah. So and, 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 but but that looks pretty current. So is he still just doing that kind of stuff, like meeting the people, and or is that a pretty pretty rare sort of thing? He doesn't stop. You know that guy, <laughs> Lord Montague, uh, loves entertaining people. He genuinely enjoys having people view his home. 
Uh, I remember sitting in his office and he, there were some kids out front playing in the garden and he was like, oh, look. You know, he was like excited that there were kids out front. And I'm like, you've had millions of people in here. <laughs> Why is this still in interesting to you? And it's just because he really genuinely enjoys people. And um, so he tries to still interact with them. Uh, unfortunately, now he's kind of more in a wheelchair. Yeah. But um, even then, he'll go around in his buggy, you know, and he'll go around and, uh, yeah, he still meets and greets people. Has he seen stuff. the film? He has seen the film. This what does he think? Um, so, you know, it, the trial and that whole period of his life was something that he never spoke about until his 80s when he wrote about it in his autobiography. It was very sensitive to him because he wanted people to not categorize him as a gay man or a bisexual. He's bisexual or whatever. They, they didn't want him to be categorized as that. He wanted people to say, look at the measure of my life. And that's the way we treat it in the film. So. I, I took a little bit of working to get him to um, open up about that. And um, so I showed him a rough cut of the trial. And I remember this because I sat in his library with him and showed him the, the rough cut of the trial. And he said something funny before it began. I showed him other scenes of the film. He's like, very good, very good. And then I was like, no, I'm going to show you part of the trial. And he goes, no, I can't promise you I'm going to like this. <laughs> so I showed it to him. And he said, he just said, very well done. Oh, that's okay. And he didn't have to say any more than that. It just let me know, like, you know, he handled it. He did show up to the, we did a private uh, deal in London to actually show some friends. And he showed up and everyone did a standing ovation for him. And it was really good for him to get to see that everyone accepted that his story was so good. Mm -hmm. So, it's something he hasn't put out there, you know. And when you watch your film, your story, I can only imagine if I were 80 years old looking back and someone projected my life on a screen, that would be pretty emotional. And to open the hatch, so to say, on those things that he hasn't even talked about to his own friends, you know, it's a pretty emotional thing. So, so this type of stuff, knowing that the people around the world are watching his film, means a lot. It does. Um, I was really intrigued by his relationship with his um, family members, and I was curious. Um, once the Bewley Motor Museum became so popular, you know, it was clear through the, your documentary that his family definitely felt neglected. Um, was this something that you, I don't know if he told you himself or just sort of from your own opinion, do you think that's something that he realized was happening at the time or something that he'd only realized later and like looking back on it that he had, that his family members had felt that way? Uh, I believe he did realize it once, um, particularly around the divorce of his first wife. Mm -hmm. um, is this? I don't know, am I giving away too much by saying this stuff, by the way? Is that cool? No. Okay. Um, during, during, when, when he divorced his first wife, I believe that was really the first pivotal moment to realize that um, I'm losing sight of what's really important. Um, so, and, and basically through the, how that became part of the film was through the interviews, we really heard, you could hear in his family members' voices that it was a sensitive thing. Like, their dad has done a lot of wonderful things. and. And his second wife, um, current wife, said it best, you know, just like any great man who's achieved something great, there's going to be sacrifices. And this is one of the things that, unfortunately, you know, it, it, it was a struggle to be with his family. That was something that he struggled with. And, um, you know, and they grew up in the public eye. So that was unfortunately a He never thing. stops. So right. even though yeah, there, there's a point of reflection, I think, that Ray said it best in the you know, he reflected on it, he realized it, but he, he's like a dog with a bone. Yeah. <laughs> and he wants to move on, mm -hmm. and he doesn't let things hold him down. Yeah. And that's perseverance. Mm -hmm. I think what, that, oh, sorry. No. I, just, I just think that that's what's made him such a good person mm -hmm. and a good story. Was there any member of the family that, that didn't want to open up, or was there anybody that was kind of like a tough <coughs> nut to crack? I, I, know, I remember that there was one person earlier on, I think it's one of his sisters, that like didn't want to talk about the trial and, and she just kind of makes a quick comment like well, I really we really don't discuss that was there anybody that was particularly difficult to get them to open up with it they were all very hesitant <laughs> I mean no one's ever spoken about it right I mean ever and, and also I think it's it's the British culture of uh, the older British culture is a little more reserved and then there it's aristocracy as well so even more reserved and more protective and and this is something that they just don't want to talk about so yes they were all you know, very hesitant to talk about it, and also wondering, what are you going to do with what I say, and who are you, and so that's why I say it took friendship and building that trust, and that's how Rafe, I got to know Rafe pretty well, we're friends, um, you know, he's friends with all of us, and, and so he opened up a lot, and his his sister, and but um, Montague's sisters, 
we didn't know too well, and I think that's one of the main reasons they didn't really say too much about it. Yeah. Well, and, and typically the older generation, like you said, they try not to talk about stuff. They're not as uh, new age right. and open to things. And, and understandably, they were. They, I think there are a lot of people in the United well, States. Well, they grew so up in a time when it was exactly. more taboo. Right. right. It was and against so the law. Yeah. It was. <laughs> it's kind of hard to so, get that mindset out of your, you know. To be told it's one thing and then all of a sudden it changes and you're like, well, I was raised under this mantra. Or mantra so. Right. Um, yeah. So did you get to drive any of the cars? <laughs> <laughs> so we got to sit in some cool cars and ride in some cool cars. We didn't get to actually drive them ourselves. The, the Rolls Royce is worth two million pounds plus. Um, I remember we put a camera on the front at one point uh, like a, with a suction cup as they're like driving down the road. And um, I think that's in the film at one point. Anyway, so I remember I, I um, went to the back of the Buley garage and asked one of the mechanics, hey, I want to put a camera right here and I touched the hood of the car. And he said, oh, thanks, now I have to buff that. I'm like, oh. what? He goes, that's German silver. And I was like, oh, sorry about that. So he said, we weren't, we weren't allowed to touch, like drive, but we got to sit in like the Back to the Future car and like, wow. you know, McLarens and all these different cool cars. And, you know, I got to ride in the Dion Bouton, the one that's from the, you know, early 1900s. Luckily, they look the other way as far as insurance goes. When they, the National Motor Museum let, let us be covered underneath their insurance, so that helps. Because we, we didn't have the insurance policy to drive them for any, any reason. So. You wreck one of those and you're in trouble. Yeah, they drive them all the time. There's also that interesting moment at the end where you talk about how Rafe is now, this is all his kingdom now, like he's inheriting this whole thing. Did you ever get the sense that he was nervous about that like was there because I, I don't remember if there's really a point in the film where you you know you ask him about it specifically but <clears throat> did he seem like he was ready to take on all of this he um, you know Rafe is not like his father in the sense that he's not necessarily one to go out to be a showman yeah so in that sense I, he's a little more reserved and a little more hesitant but he told me um, it just didn't make the film, but he realized that when you are Lord Montague, when you are the Lord, which is what he will become, that you have to be that leader and you have to be that man. And so um, he's ready to take it on. And he's always, as since little boys have seen the film, loved Bewley. Loved, you know, one day knowing that he's, it's going to be his. And so he's looked forward to it. It's just the interactions with the people that, that is, is not, the public lifestyle is not something that he necessarily likes. Yeah. You talked about your interactions with the aristocracy and stuff. How 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 about your your coming in with your Texas twang to the 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 uh, the, the servant class, the the butlers and the maids, and how did how did they put, handle you guys? I, I I don't know that it was handled any different as far as the butlers and the maids were concerned. They were kind of excited to have new people. Well, you know, they like anybody. They would joke and be like, "Oh, you, you Texans, you know, the cowboy boots and all, you know, and ask, you know, the ride horses, horses in you ride, town and ride horses, <laughs> exactly. ask about the show Dallas." Um, <laughs> but it's it's jokey. It's not. They don't. There wasn't ever a looking down at or you're not involved in our group, so we're not going to talk to you. They were very open, very great to work with. They were interested in us, just like we were interested exactly. in them. You know, like uh, Dina, the cook. At, uh, at Palace House, always made us a fruit cake and put it on the stairs. As every time we'd show up, it would be right there because she knew we liked it. Oh and um, they stocked the fridge with Budweisers, but <laughs> I tried one and it was 10 years past its expiration. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really kind of them, but I just you know didn't check the thing. Um, so you know they try to cater to us, and you know they would you know try and make us good coffee, and but of course they make amazing tea. You know, so it was always. It was fun, you know. It was fun. So you got along well with everybody except maybe the mechanics who had to buff the cars. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they. I will tell you what. They were not too keen on because they're always like, "Oh, now we got to get the rolls out, and they got to film it doing this." And the whole time they're thinking, "This is such an expensive asset that we have to look after." And who are yeah. these guys filming? You know, constantly driving us insane. So they were very nice to it, us. But. It didn't help that we were back and forth six times. Six times. <laughs> <laughs> so every time they were, we thought this was going to be done by now. <laughs> there were three times we left and I'm like, well, we'll see you when the film's done and then we'd be back again. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough story to tell, you know. It is. It's, it's so difficult, so I want to be thorough. Well, with the, um, the great surgeons of Downton Abbey, I mean, how has that sort of played into where y'all are going and what you're doing and even, I mean, because it was 
this y'all started doing this even before before that. Um, I'm just curious about about the parallel. I think it's great timing. I think that Downton Abbey is, if you like Downton Abbey, you're going to love this film um, because it's a more personal view of an actual aristocrat. So it's like kind of like the real Downton Abbey with scandals. Kind of <laughs> yeah. um, and exactly. it's helped bring exposure to the film. And I think that's wonderful. And I just really hope that, um, you know, I think if it came out two years ago, I don't know if it would be as big of a deal. And I think that right now it's going to help us build momentum, hopefully. Um, so I think it's just great timing. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just, we just like to have the relevance. Yes. <laughs> so, because it's completely relevant. It is. Um, and PBS, if you're out there, you should check out the film. I do. PBS? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> com. Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily from the scandal perspective, but for, from Lord Montague opening up the Motor Museum and then his home to revitalize his family's finances, did it seem a little more natural for an American to tell that story because it's not only more entrepreneurial than most Brits would have been in such an instance, but also more exhibitionist in a way to where an American audience would look and go, well, of course he opened up his home. Why wouldn't you? You know, it's a source of revenue. But for other British, you know, the, the, the royals who you see looking down on it while it's spectacle and it's, you know, undesired, do you think that being an American filmmaker, you were able to tell that side of the story better than a European career would have been able to do otherwise? Absolutely. I, I think that because we knew nothing about the stately home business, we had no clue what, what that was about. Every, all of that was very interesting. And like I said, we didn't have this preconceived notion of that. Um, other aristocrats, yeah, they did look down on this as being, oh, the dreadful commercial Lord Montague. <laughs> and, um, which to me, I thought that's kind of comical yeah. and so it, it is kind of comical in the film and, and um, so yeah it, yes the, the British culture I, I you know they, they have stately homes we don't have them here we have I think one really big house in Virginia or something like that and but we don't have that and so it's something totally new when you see these homes and it's and and um, yeah I, I, I yeah but you know at the same time when they open the houses the Brit it British people flocked to them because they wanted to know what was behind those walls as well. So everybody's curious. I think this is just a time for Americans to learn that that stuff even exists if you didn't even know it did. Absolutely. Well, and part of it is the fact that all of our lifetimes, they have been open. And so <clears throat> for that to be something <clears throat> new, I mean, that was a revelation to me. I was like, oh, so they never had any, you know, anybody in their homes before. I've been through some of those homes, and you know, you just think, oh well, of course they they have their own, they have a museum, they live up upstairs or wherever, and you know, but knowing that that's not that wasn't the norm forever, that that's a really recent. It was just sequence of events. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It was tax. Everything was taxed so much that they had to start doing something. Right. And it makes perfect sense to turn your assets and use your assets to your advantage. Yeah. And on your note about. Um, the entrepreneurial side. I, I, I grew up, both my parents have their own businesses, and I got the entrepreneurial bug, so I found that part fascinating myself, that he's, a, and even Lord Monty even says, I'm a businessman. And for an aristocrat to do anything, really anything, um, is kind of a big deal. <laughs>